So hello everyone. <coughs> Today I, from home, I estimated, um, I didn't, didn't have the exact same setup at home so I wasn't able to test this exactly. I'm going to adjust this little box so that I can get it a little more directly fitting to the uh, video here. So give me just one moment here. So help me build my PowerPoint so that it, they are a little more conducive to lecturing here. Okay. One last quick change gives everybody online a chance to log in and get up to speed anyway. All right. There we go. So in case you haven't been watching online ever, this little box is kind of where I'm drawing an imaginary line uh, normally because that's where my picture is showing up. Anyway, so we'll get started today. Um, I've not posted the third homework yet, but I plan to later today. Um, and if I don't get to it today, I'll do, definitely get it up tomorrow. Um, so that'll be up for you. Last time we left off with uh, membrane filtration and I gave you a kind of an example problem to work on. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be posting a similar form of that example uh, to the homework, so then we can go through that um, example. Uh, if you have any questions next time, once you've gotten a chance to take a look at the homework, um, happy to show it, show that to you and um, walk you through parts of it. All right, so today we're going to be talking about membrane, uh, excuse me, about disinfection, which is uh, in some sense, my, my expertise here, um, it's what I've probably studied the most and am most interested in and um, maybe most knowledgeable, knowledgeable about. <clears throat> so it's a fun topic. Um, and the way I like to start talking about disinfection is really <clears throat> to define the difference between is something sterile or is it disinfected? And what does that mean? So my bottle of water here, um, I had left it in my car for a couple days. I grabbed it this morning, rinsed it out, and filled it up before coming uh, to lecture. And so if you think about what's happened here, I put disinfected water that went through the distribution system, came into through my fancy new refrigerator. We spent like a month after moving without a full-size refrigerator and I'm very happy to actually have a refrigerator again. Um, so it poured me some nice water. It passed through some carbon filter. So the question is, are there any living organisms in here? Does that matter? What's going on? So do we want our water to be sterile? That's kind of the first question. Um, do you think that water should be sterile to drink? And there's only a few of you here. Normally I'd say, like, let's raise hands and see how many people think that way. Um, so maybe, maybe in the chat and, for, and uh, here, give me a yes or a, a hand raise if you think ideally our target is to have sterile water for, for drinking. How many yeses? OK. <clears throat> Yeah, is that our target? Okay, so the, and I've got at least one yes here, um, and a no. Okay, how about, um, how about disinfected? Is that, you know, is that sufficient? I mean, I guess that's the inverse, so okay. So, yeah, the, the deal is it would be nice to, to think about our water as perfectly disinfected. But in reality, this water that I'm about to drink for you, you know, I didn't sterilize this, this container and there's not enough chlorine residual in here to do much. So chances are I've put some of my own saliva in here over the past few days and it sat there 
There's probably some organisms in the water that comes in anyway. There's certainly going to be some viruses, actually. Um, but the thing is, there might be millions and millions of bacteria and viruses in here, if you were to count them all, but I have no problem taking a drink from this bottle, aside from the mask. There's probably also lots of algae in there. So the, the deal is, what we don't want is pathogens, first of all. We can have a, as many non-pathogenic stuff that doesn't affect us as, as we want. That's no problem. Um, and we can actually have pathogens in here. Maybe there are some pathogenic organisms. But as long as they're not at infectious levels, then we're OK. So it's, a, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And we don't actually design our disinfection systems to be sterile. Um, it would kind of, in a sense, be nice so that there's no, no concern whatsoever. But it turns out we can manage pretty well with just achieving some disinfection goals so that we, we reach uh, a point where there's no more um, pathogens at infectious levels. So that's, that's kind of the big, the big thing here. And if you were to take a look at um, typical tools you might use for disinfection or sterilization, this uh, pressure cooker over here on the left, we would call it an autoclave if we're dealing with like a laboratory sort of situation. That'll allow us to heat water up to a temperature that's beyond boiling point because it pressurizes it. So we typically get something like one, 121 degrees Celsius, and remember 100 is the boiling point. Um, and then we leave it there for like 20 or 30 minutes, and then we're pretty sure that we've denatured all the DNA, all the RNA, anything that could have um, any organisms that could have been pathogenic or living at all can no longer reproduce. So the definition of sterilization, um, it's actually interesting because, you know, in this case, we really destroy the microbes. They're certainly not living or um, able to reproduce in the case of viruses that aren't really living. But there are other ways to sterilize um, a a solution of water. In fact, we use the word st sterility or sterilization to describe what we do to an animal if we cause it to not be able to produce anymore, um, or plants. So you might have uh, certain hybrid animals or plants that have been crossbred between a couple species, and it's a sterile outcome. Um, in that case, what we're dealing with, we could technically do the same thing with microbes. We could have a living organism. We could have a living Ebola, or not living, but a live, active Ebola virus and give it to somebody as if it were to infect them. As long as it can't reproduce, that's no problem, right? So if we've sterilized it, we've changed it in some way so that it is not capable of reproducing or being reproduced by a host cell. So even the most dangerous of organisms would just be fine. Um, and there, there is a distinction there because most of the time what we're talking about is an infection, something that's reproducing, making more and more of itself. There's also an issue if it's producing a toxin, some bacteria can do that, and it would usually be kind of a both situation. Uh, botulism is an example of maybe you have a can of food that had botulinum um, spores in it and eventually they, they're able to grow and then they produce a toxin. So even if you don't have live cells, the toxin is still there and can be a very bad problem. So um, aside from the toxins, which is kind of a separate issue, as long as the cell or virus can't replicate, we can call that sterile and that's no problem. Along those lines for disinfection, um, as long as we don't have enough of them to cause an infection in the water. So as long as, you know, maybe there's you know, 200 Vibrio cholera bacteria cells in here. That's actually not enough to make me sick, even if I drink the whole thing in one go. Um, it, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute, but um, so long as it's not enough to give me an infection, um, technically it's okay. So that's when we start thinking about how to design disinfection systems, um, we don't need to go to the extremes heating some, you know, some volume of water at a high pressure, high temperature um, for a certain amount of time. 
Um, we could just simply remove enough of them with chlorine or with a UV system. This is a, a diagram of a UV system where water would probably go in here, go through the contactor, and then out the other way, uh, something like that. Um, and we can make it continuous, less energy requirement, things like that. So we don't actually target sterility, even though that might be nice, uh, in part because we, we send our water through a distribution system that's underground. There's going to be some leakage in places, and so we try to keep the pressure as positive so it's pushing water out, preventing contamination from coming in, but there's still some ability for microbes to eventually transfer and come in, go along the, uh, those leaks, and get at least coating the, the surfaces in our, in our pipes. So we do expect um, both bacteria, viruses, algae, some other stuff to be there just in small quantities. Um, it's not that we want it there, but it's just going to happen. So just kind of as a reminder, what we're doing uh, in the scheme of things uh, in terms of a uh, treatment plant, uh, we've talked a lot about sedimentation, coagulation, flocculation, all that, then some filtration step. Then we're ready. We have water that doesn't have particles that would protect bacteria or viruses because, you know, a bacteria or virus is a very small particle. If they can piggyback on a larger particle and be protected, maybe somehow inside, shielded from UV light, or maybe uh, chlorine's going to react with stuff at the surface of some particle but not get into all the bacteria that's kind of on the inside. Um, we've gotten rid of all of that stuff, and we've got clear water in that sense. Then we um, use a disinfection contactor, typically. Uh, especially if we're doing a chlorination system, it's going to look something like this where we've got that plug flow type of process through a system. Um, and then it's going to be distributed. A lot of times we'll add fluoride, which is um, useful for a few reasons. One, tracing how quickly the water is flowing through the system, but also um, with the right dose is a, a huge benefit to our dental hygiene. Okay, so this uh, dis disinfectant contactor and then actually the dis distribution system itself is what constitutes our disinfection step in uh, a drinking water treatment plant. And so those are, are both relevant and we're gonna talk, um, talk about how we manage those. Okay, so the type of pathogen or type of um, microbe that we're dealing with um, plays a big role in terms of how we're, what we're selecting as our, our strategy to disinfect, how much dose we require to do the disinfection, all of that type of thing. So we have three major classes. One would be viruses, another would be bacteria, then we have larger uh, protozoa. And these, you know, as you see, will we'll kind of, this is kind of ordered smallest to biggest here, um, where viruses, you know, and there's some exceptions. There's a few bacteria species that are exceptionally large and you can actually potentially see them with your, vis your naked eye. Um, there's also some very large viruses that may be about as big as some of the smallest bacteria, but typically you're going to have something like uh, 20 to 200 nanometers size range for this. Bacteria would be uh, maybe 0.5 at the larger end would be something like 10 micrometers, usually not that big, and protozoa would probably be something like um, 10 to 30 micrometers um, in diameter. <clears throat> so obviously uh, viruses are, are really just um, an elaborate mechanism that has some DNA that's going to be replicated by a host cell and some contraption, some proteins surrounding it um, to allow, allow a little bit of protection of that uh, DNA or RNA and then some method of uh, attacking a host cell. So some um, molecular equipment there that when the, the virus happens to encounter a cell, it will um, uh, attach to the surface and inject its genetic code to make more copies of this virus. Um, bacteria and protozoa are both cells. Um, bacteria are prokaryotic. 
protozoa are technically eukaryotic. It's a difference in the cell wall, kind of some physiology, but they're both single cell organisms. Um, amoeba fall in the category of protozoa, and then we often call this cryptosporidium, which I'll be posting that, um, that quiz on that, that paper um, probably next. Um, it'll, that'll be a good way to kind of encapsulate the all three components of um, this uh, second unit of our class. So that the cryptosporidium and giardia are often called um, parasites, just kind of a, a general term. There, that's kind of too uh, too broad of a term, but they're they're sort of like amoeba, but not classified as amoeba. They're still protozoa. Um, anyway, all all of these can be infectious. So I'll go through a few examples of each here. So viruses, we have norovirus. You may have heard about rotavirus, poliovirus. I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, and many more. These are good examples of um, food and waterborne uh, infectious diseases uh, on, in terms of viruses, and they will, you know, that, that's a, uh, a common route of transmission we talked about before is cons consumption of something that contains um, fecal matter of some sort. Now, uh, something like Norovirus, well, really all of these. Poliovirus is just about um, completely eliminated. I think there's a, maybe a couple places in the world that still have uh, that battle ongoing, but we've done a, a great job with vaccines, so we almost have no problem with that anymore. But something like norovirus and rotavirus is actually a good reason not to eat raw shellfish, uh, so raw oysters, um, because these virus particles act a lot like the uh, particles that oysters are consuming all the time and using for food and so they'll get stuck in the the meat and then we'll just hang out there and it'll be kind of a way to concentrate them so if you've got a wastewater treatment plant and then a river and then an oyster bed um, that could be bad news um, which is why sometimes you'll see some sort of seasonality in terms of when uh, when they're safer or not so safe to eat based on the currents and things like that where they're hard to harvest it from you could do it if you like it, but you just have a, a bit higher risk of getting something like that. Um, if you've ever experienced um, food poisoning, or a, there's technically a difference between food poisoning and food infection. Infection is what we normally experience if you eat something and then you know, eight plus hours later you become ill and you're like, oh man, that, that last meal that I ate, it's really probably two or three meals ago Sometimes it could be even up to two days ago. Um, but we always have that last meal bias. So uh, I remember when I was in grad school, I had something, it was probably norovirus or something. Um, the last thing I had eaten was pizza. And so that, you know, I didn't want pizza then for the next few months. But I think it was actually a, um, a uh, Mexican restaurant that I had happened to go to for lunch um, uh, that, I think I may have had a friend also that got sick from it, but anyway, so that was, um, that's like you get real sick real bad for like 24 hours and then it's kind of done. That's usually something along these lines. Um, now there's an interesting, an interesting um, feature about when we study these pathogens, because really the, there's a common phrase, the dose makes the poison um, in terms of uh, health and, and public health sort of stuff. And this is meaning like if, if you have a poison, but a really, really small dose of it, it's not gonna affect you, right? So it's the amount that you're consuming that's gonna make the, pro make the issue. So you could also say the same thing for the infection. So it turns out that different pathogens have different amounts of cells or virus particles that are required in order to make you sick. So, um, for things like the viruses, this is typically a pretty low dose requirement uh, where something like tens to one hundreds of, vi of virus particles to get you sick. So if, if I knew there were a thousand uh, norovirus particles in here, I would definitely not drink anymore because that would not be fun. Um, this says tens to one hundreds. 
So let's see if I can make it a little clearer. So just kind of on that order. Um, and it, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, but it's really interesting to think about how you would actually study that, right? So uh, the bacteria, on the other hand, <clears throat> some examples would be Vibrio, Vibrio cholera, E. coli, Salmonella, and lots of others. Um, botulism is another bacteria. So these guys, um, a lot of them are food infections, but bacteria also have are the ones that can do a food poisoning where they actually produce a toxin, like uh, botulism. So uh, Vibrio cholera happens to be, you know, you've, you've probably heard about cholera uh, in our, our current era. It's really a, mostly a problem in disaster relief type of situations, developing countries that are having a, you know, a hard time in some way with infrastructure, Haiti, there's a lot of cholera going on there, and it's um, it's been very difficult for them. Um, it used to be one of the big plagues that was um, feared quite a bit, and we'll talk about an example and kind of the the history um, of that one in particular, and how that was important to our modern understanding of public health and uh, water treatment. So we'll come back to that, but it's um, it actually requires something like um, 10,000, so 10 to the fourth um, to 10 to the fifth. So tens to maybe 100,000 uh, uh, Vibrio cholera cells in order to um, make you sick. Part of that is because cholera happens to be um, pretty vulnerable to acidic conditions and our stomach has a lot of stomach acid, right? So if you were, if you were to give me this bottle of water and tell me, okay, there's exactly in this one liter um, there's exactly 10,000 cholera cells in here and you have to drink it or else I'm gonna shoot you something like that you know I forced to drink it well if I had a choice I would say okay I'm gonna drink this on a completely empty stomach and I'm gonna drink it a little bit at a time over some time and then my stomach will probably actually take care of things because that acidity you know if I if I down it all at once, maybe my acid gets too dilute and it doesn't um, doesn't kill the kill off enough cells. But if I can kill off, um, you know, 80% of the cells there, I've reduced it from, you know, 10 to the fifth down to, um, you know, 10 to the fourth somewhere. Um, a significant reduction like that may actually prevent me from acquiring an infection. So it it's kind of interesting some. Uh, some cells uh, will act differently. I think E. coli is more, uh, and E. coli, some of them will produce toxins. Sometimes they'll produce toxins when they're inside your stomach. Um, I think these are probably more like 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth range, not, not as high of a requirement. Um, and salmonella as well, I think, is probably somewhere similar like that. Um, cholera just particularly takes quite a, quite a bit of the bacteria to, to make you sick. Um, <clears throat> I had a thought. So one, one interesting thing, kind of noting that, that difference between the infection and the poisoning, um, the reason we are careful in general not to feed honey to infants is because infants don't have a very acidic stomach. And the uh, there's potential for honey to have botulinum bacteria in it and there would be spores and when a botulinum spore um, encounters stomach acid it's pretty much no problem and then it's actually the the space the um, immediately after the stomach I forgot the the technical anatomical term but that area um, in infants is uh, not acidic at all and it's actually pretty good growing conditions for botulinum bacteria so if they start growing and get to a point where they've um, got enough of them there, they can produce the botulinum toxin, and that's quite lethal. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing that we never think about as adults, um, or since you're, uh, you know, partially developed uh, child, um, you can have honey or whatever, and it's no big deal. But it's there's actually some things that our body is taking care of 
um, that an infant, for example, cannot because the, they just don't have that stomach acidity yet. Okay, um, so the next would be protozoa. And these guys are actually much more infectious, so they, they require just a few, um, a few cells, a few cysts, um, to get you sick. And that's a kind of a big deal because um, they are quite hardy. So when they form cysts, um, so we have amoebic cysts, but these guys can also form cysts sometimes. And they're very resistant to chlorination and other uh, disinfection strategies. We'll say cysts resist chlorination. And so if it only takes um, something like, um, I think it was between one and five, somewhere in that range, cells uh, to infect. Then you really need to make sure they're pretty much all gone. Um, now, th there's another complicating factor here in terms of how much um, how much of these are discharged by a sick person or a sick animal that's uh, excreting these, and you know th these are larger um, larger cells. They're not produced in quite the high volume as viruses would be from a, somebody infected with a virus, um, or even as much as bacteria. Um, cholera, for example. Um, we'll talk more about it, but it, you end up excreting a lot of them, so that's, that's why it can, can still infect other organisms when it's, it requires such a high dose, is because it produces just lots of them. Okay, so the, the entertaining part about all of this, I mean, it, maybe it's already a little bit entertaining, but how would you go and study how many virus particles it would take to make you sick? Just think about designing that experiment for a moment. Okay, so I, I took um, a couple classes in a public health program uh, during my engineering graduate program, and it was, I went to a different school, ended up actually meeting my wife this way, at a wastewater treatment plant, sorry, um, of all places. So that, that's kind of fun. But during one of those classes, I learned that the way, the way we know these, or have some idea of them, is actually human volunteer trials. So um, places like the CDC would, would say, all right, uh, we need to test, we need to understand how many noroviruses does it take to make you sick? And so what they do then is they recruit a bunch of healthy volunteers, uh, probably college students, grad students, I, I kind of wish I, I knew about it, and be like, okay, I'll give you a thousand bucks if we can maybe or maybe not make you sick and feed you and house you for a week so that we can control what you're consuming and control these and monitor you and make sure you you recover and all of that. Um, so then you get a bunch of volunteers, you give, give them each a dose that may be a placebo, so maybe that's nothing, or maybe you've got the uh, you know 200 million virus dose, or maybe you've got the two virus dose. So you're just crossing your fingers <laughs> and waiting to maybe be sick. <laughs> so it's a quite a um, a funny thing when you think about it like would would you do it and you know that it might be quite tempting if you're um, you know I, I think that I probably would have done it if I had known about a, an opportunity like that and would have just been crossing my fingers hoping to uh, hoping to be the lucky asymptomatic one because there's some portion of them even if you do get sick you might be asymptomatic so all of this also kind of ties into what we're dealing with with the coronavirus. You know, you, you can imagine that the dose of that may be important. Um, there's some, some people are, are thinking that it may also be important um, how much of a dose you get deep within your lungs compared to maybe a, a small dose in the front of your uh, nasal cavity. That might make a difference. Um, but yeah, and then if you're asymptomatic, Okay, maybe you have it, maybe you're spreading it, maybe you're not. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting and uh, interesting uncertainties, and it's it's not easy to do direct human studies. You have to kind of have volunteers like that, and there's ethical questions involved, and got to have all sorts of approvals. Um, so I, I just always thought that was uh, fairly um, entertaining. Uh, yeah, so 
got a question here. Um, am I working on a study of coronavirus at LSU water right now? Um, technically, yes. Um, I would say mostly it's uh, my colleague, Dr. John Pardue, is kind of spearheading this. I'm involved, but haven't been, um, haven't really been uh, able to be heavily involved uh, just yet. Um, so I'm, I'm partly aware of what's going on and it's pretty interesting what, essentially what we're looking at is the coronavirus can also infect your intestines like one of these other viruses, but it and then can give you some symptoms. I don't think it would be quite as acute or bad as norovirus, but you know, diarrhea, things like that are, are one of the symptoms. And so then what happens is if you're flushing that down the toilets, then there's actually quite a high virus load going through the toilets, you know, going through the sewer system. So what this, this project is going on is about um, taking a look and seeing if we can um, detect the DNA particles. Even if the virus is not intact, we use something called PCR. Um, it's actually the vet school, um, there's a group over there that's doing this, this side of it. As we collect that, uh, those samples, um, and there's some question about, okay, when are they being flushed? What time of the day? How do we composite a, a sample to be, you know, to have an indication of um, how much people are contributing to this flow? Really trying to understand what would this mean in terms of how many people are infected if we have some signal. So anyway, we, we detect that and then we can say, all right, well, there's a whole bunch of virus signal coming from this pumping station, but not that one. So looks like we've got more infections over here and we're uh, working towards um, really making that a, uh, a more clear, uh, excuse me, and more um, defined structured type of approach. And there's actually a lot of people trying to do that across, across the world, across the country right now. So some, some interesting things going on there. Um, and so thanks for asking. Uh, these bacteria over here, I just included, I, I was doing a Google search on uh, Vibrio cholera. Um, this is uh, some sort of a image scan. They usually have sort of a flagella, which maybe we can see there. Um, I thought this was a pretty good image because we can also see this is probably, it's likely the way they captured this image was taking a membrane and putting bacteria, you know, putting a solution of cholera in water passing it through that membrane and then taking this image of the membrane with the bacteria on it. So we can, it's kind of a good example of separating bacteria with a membrane. I would guess these pores are, you know, if this, if this is one micrometer probably or something like that, then that pore size, you know, maybe that's a, probably smaller than a 0.2, it's probably a 0 0.04, something like that micrometer. Um, oops. So just thought that would be uh, interesting. Oh yeah, we have the um, scale bar right here, one micrometer. Yeah, so I thought that might be a kind of neat to take a look at. All right. Um, there's a chance that I need to Okay, I think I just maybe didn't finish this slide and I thought I did. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the history. Um, and really, so I had some confusion with my, my system. This, this might be the wrong PowerPoint. Um, we'll find out before long, but I'll, um, I'll post whatever makes sense. For now, we'll just talk about the history for a moment. Um, really, I just wanted to show the next slides anyway. So for understanding how diseases are being transmitted. Um, there is some history. I told you before that I may or may not be related to Jon Snow. I, I do have a brother by the name Jonathan who goes by Jon Snow sometimes. Um, but this is not the same Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. This is a, a uh, you know, used to be more famous, I guess. Um, a doctor who lived in the 1800s, so around there was a big cholera outbreak in 1850. So I'll just write up some notes that I meant to type. So 1850s, 
There was a cholera out outbreak in London. And he was a, a doctor who, uh, so a, a medical doctor. And back then, you know, you, anybody in that type of profession was really, uh, or may, was likely to be kind of a scientist, sort of a person interested in exploring what's happening on a phenomenological level. Um, and so when this cholera outbreak was happening, he ended up finding uh, and being really the first to um, provide some, some straightforward evidence of the, the germ theory of disease, right? So we, before we knew about germs, microbes, really small things that we can't see with our eyes that can make you sick, um, before we knew about that, you know, all sorts of theories were fair game, right? Oh, it's the, they would call it the miasma, the, the kind of stinky vapors that are around um, yucky areas that you associate with sickness and disease and all of that. Um, so he was the first to really show that, hey, in this water, he, he was taking a look at it and ended up looking at it through a magnifying glass. And it, we're not clear, we're not sure that he actually saw the bacteria themselves, but he thought he saw something like that uh, associated with the water that was making people sick. And so he really, you know, I can't remember if it was if it was actually the bacteria he was seeing or if it was something close enough and he mislabeled it, but he was correct in, in his wrongness. Um, but either way, he, he really was the first to establish that germ. Well, I'm not sure if he was the first to establish the theory, but he was certainly um, very uh, vital in that discovery. And the reason was because once he had some idea that, oh, maybe there's something in the water that's causing this, then he went, bought, he went and made a map of everybody that's getting sick and went out and did interviews and asked them where they got their water. So there was a, that map was really the first time that we would say some sort of epidemiological study had been, was, was taking place. So um, this ended up being called the ghost map which is also the, the name of a great book that's um, on this story. They, they basically took the historical account um, and made it not fictitious, but a, uh, they, they retold the account in story form, filling in, making some dialogue, things like that. So some of it's technically fictitious, but it's based on, you know, based on exactly the facts as best they, you know, the, that they were able. Um, so th this is a, uh, picture of that book. Again, I, I ended up reading this for that public health class. Um, it's a, a short and easy read, entertaining and um, so entertaining intrigue, hist historical account. I'd, so highly recommend it, um, especially if you're interested in stuff in this class in general. Um, and it's a relatively short, short book as well. So essentially what they did, what he did was he, he took this map um, and there's this famous uh, Broad Street pump. We'll see that in a moment. So they, he took this map and each spot you see this uh, a little black square. I'll, on the next, next slide I'll show you a little more clearly. Um, essentially every little square is one death. And so when you see a stack of several squares on top of each other, that's multiple deaths in one household. So the thing about cholera the way it works is it essentially takes your, um, I think it's your small intestine in particular, its functions, which is normally to extract water and extract nutrients from uh, your food stream, uh, whatever you ingested, all of that. And instead of um, extracting, cholera in, infects the uh, cells in your intestines and cause them to reverse direction. So instead of taking water out of the food and out of the uh, stuff, it's taking water out of the body and putting it into the waste stream. And so when you do that, you end up dehydrating the, the person very quickly. And back in the 1850s, 
we didn't really know exactly how to care for somebody who's being dehydrated like that. Nowadays, it's really simple. Um, we know exactly what to do, and if you've got access to something as simple as Gatorade, you're going to be uncomfortable for about a week, but you'll probably be just fine. Um, and especially with an IV, our survival rates for cholera these days, if you have the medical attention, is near perfect. Um, but if you didn't have any medical um, attention and you didn't know about how to hydrate, the importance of electrolytes in, in addition to just straight water, um, then it's a, quite a lethal disease because that dehydration can kill you um, within hours. So it's uh, probably like eight to 12 type hours, maybe more um, for a bad infection. So in, in London, you know, it's crowded city, very unhygienic. Uh, you can imagine in the read, reading that book will, will uh, help your um, imagination there as well. Okay, so there's a question, what's the difference from dysentery? I think dysentery is a synonym. Um, I'd have to double check that, but I, th I think that's synonymous to uh, cholera. I think that's was one of the generic terms, you know, it's, they would call it the plague or call it dysentery. I think, I think it's the same thing. Um, so what happened was when you had all these people getting sick in this, this one area, you can kind of see where the black dots are, uh, occurring um, you know that's it it's terrifying and you know people multiple people in each in some households were just dying within you know a day or two it's like that's that's a scary plague when you don't know what's causing it or what to do about it right that's that's pretty terrifying so um, here's a kind of a better representation um, so what John Snow did was he made this map and he then labeled the different water pumps because he had that idea in his mind that it was somehow caused to the water and you can see all these little flags uh, put on this map these blue flags here and the there's one right here in the middle and i should probably use a different color um called the broad street uh well that one turns out to be the the source of the epidemic here and in doing this, he was really the first one, um, we call him the father of epidemiology because mapping disease incidences or the rate at which people are uh, getting disease or dying, um, that is kind of what epidemiology is all about. He didn't have any children, so I'm not directly related, but who knows, maybe one of his uh, siblings um, or something. Okay, so, um, you know, you can see it's just kind of crazy to think that all of the, you know, a neighborhood like this or, a, you know, several blocks in a city having that many deaths and it's just all right there. It, it was rather, rather crazy. So um, once he had some idea that it was really attributed to this well, he took the handle off the pump and he removed it and then the outbreak subsided um, from that point. Now there might be a couple cases of you know other transmission um, but generally the issue was this pump and they even learned that the deal was there was um, a family living in a house uh, right on top of like right above this pump and of course with their uh, the lack of modern uh, sanitary systems they had like a, a kind of a pit latrine sort of a deal. And they, they actually had an infant who I think had been taken from some, uh, somewhere, had come in from somewhere, some, they had traveled, and the infant had cholera. Now, infants um, have a different reaction to cholera and they don't, um, since their intestines aren't as it developed, it, it doesn't have as, ex as an extreme of a, um, response and they, they typically live longer, maybe survive better. And so there was an infant excreting essentially into where this pump was drawing from for, for a couple of weeks. Um, and so that's ultimately the conclusion of, and probably the first time ever we've 
identified like, oh, hey, here's the source of an outbreak and here's how, like, here's exactly what's going wrong. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's a very interesting story. Again, I'd highly recommend it. Um, probably spent a little too much time talking about it. <laughs> but I hope that, was, uh, hope that was entertaining and interesting. Okay, so the role then of disinfection, um, as we know, it's quite obvious that we ought to be uh, disinfecting. So I want to talk about the disinfection strategies we can use. Um, probably next time we'll get into most of the math and, and deriving some rate constants, things like that. Um, but we'll we'll start talking about the uh, strategies now and what what to consider for them. So we've talked already about free chlorine. Um, we can actually apply it in several forms. It could be Cl2 gas, could be NaCO, NaOCl, or maybe calcium hypochlorite, so CaOCl2. And remember that's because calcium is 2 plus, OCl as a unit is 1 minus, if you were to dissociate that. So you need the 2 to balance the, the 2 minuses to balance the 1 2 plus, or NaOCl. Um, and the reason chlorine gas will work, because it, it goes Cl2 in the gas form plus water will react and that'll give us um, let's see it's chlor chlorine minus plus H plus plus HOCl so that one one Cl goes to chloride so Cl minus Cl minus is pretty much inert it doesn't react much with stuff this is not our reactive species here it's the OCl that's the reactive stuff that's the thing that bleaches stuff that does the oxidation Cl minus is pretty much everywhere that you know that's what you get with table salt you can't bleach stuff with table salt right that's that's just kind of inert but that other port that other one ends up in this reaction well it kicks off one hydrogen that's why you get a little bit of acid coming off the H plus and then what we're left with is H O and Cl which is exactly what we've got there H O C L um, so that's ends up how we can get chlorine the way we're familiar with it in the class we've we've talked about the HOCl um, from chlorine gas it doesn't really matter which way we apply it um, I'm just letting you know that's that's one way we can and that's the equation once that happens then remember we always have some dissociation because we have an equilibrium reaction between HOCl and OCl minus with that H plus. Okay, so if we were to add a certain amount of Cl2 gas to water, then we could, you know, find out how much, um, what mass of that gas we had, convert that to moles. Then we've got one mole of Cl2 gas to one mole of HOCl. That'll give us a molar concentration of HOCl that'll be our total total chlorine that we've added and then we go through this system and we have our our um, equilibrium equation like we've dealt with in the past there are also things called chloramines um, basically this happens when you react OCL with amines um, or amine groups basically NH3 like um, ammonia type stuff um, or some molecule that has that group on it and so you might get something like um, let's see a CL, I think it's let's see, CL2NH, uh, what was it? Should remember this off the top of my head. We get we get different forms, and we can have different uh, amounts of um, protons there, so different amounts of hydrogens. Or sorry, this was, should be NH2. Not sure why that's not erasing for me. Okay. All right. So this should have been. Um, you got a question? Yeah. In the free chlorine, it doesn't form uh, the H plus and Cl minus don't form like hydrochloric acid. 
Um, no, that's a, so the question is the uh, Cl minus and the H plus, uh, do they form hydrochloric acid? Um, now that my cursor is working again, HCl hydrochloric acid can go, you know, when it's dissociated will react and create those two, but that's, it's a lot harder to reverse that. Um, that's not, it's not a reversible reaction in that manner. So that's, um, it's a good question, but that'll be this way only. It, I mean, in a sense, it has the same effect in terms of adding that acidity, um, but you don't actually get HCl itself. Okay, so now that I've got my cursor and stuff, so we have ClNH2, this should have one minus. Um, so that's chloramine, and you can have dichloramine, Cl2, NH2, 2. Uh, I think I've got that right. So um, there's, there's different chloramines that you can, you can consider and similar species. Uh, this may also have an, I think this has an L, Cl, OCL. Yeah, I will, uh, I will update this. I'm kicking myself for not having this on the top of my head, but I'll add this um, so you have, have it on the slides. It's not too important. I would give you the reaction and everything if you did need it. My, my point here, I wanted to talk about the chlorines is because, especially for wastewater, when we have a lot of ammonia in the water, we end up, um, we end up producing a lot of chloramine and it takes away this reactive chlorine and produces this combined chlorine is what we call it, that's combined itself with the, um, the, these nitrogen groups and it's formed a weaker oxidant. So this stuff, um, it lasts longer. And so actually in drinking water, we intentionally do it for the distribution system, but uh, it also takes longer to kill the bacteria or whatever pathogen we're looking at. So it's a, a, a bit of a trade-off there. It can be useful, but we don't want it to happen without our, our consent, so to speak, or without wanting it to happen, without controlling it properly. We can also add chlorine as chlorine dioxide. Um, this is reactive in itself. This, so this is going to be distinct from this HOCl, that what we call free chlorine. So the combination of HOCl and OCl minus, that's generally what we refer to as free chlorine. Chlorine dioxide is another form of reactive chlorine. Um, uh, it is distinct, ha we'll have a different um, reactivities than the HOCl stuff, different reactivities than the chloramines as well. We also have ozone, so O3. This is um, naturally occurring. We know that, we know it pretty well from the atmosphere. It is an oxidant, so we don't like it in our lower atmosphere where it can irritate our lungs, um, but we do like that it absorbs UV light up in the upper atmosphere. So we can use this um, directly as an oxidant with that is employed sometimes, it's pretty good against the cryptosporidium spores. Um, so it, that's one of its uh, uses in water treatment. We can also use just UV light. It's uh, not a chemical method here. So this is the first that we're, um, I guess you could call it a photochemical method maybe, but it's a, uh, you know, we're not adding a chemical. So it's not, not strictly a chemical technology here. Um, and then instead of dosing based on the amount of oxidant we add and the amount of time it is there, this is more like the amount of light that the solution is going to receive. Uh, then we have advanced oxidation technologies. This is not really um, disinfection per se. It's usually used for degrading some pharmaceutical compounds or something a little harder to, to get at. It would certainly disinfect and it, it falls quite in line with uh, these processes. It actually typically will combine UV and hydrogen peroxide or ozone, could even maybe do chlorine. So it's kind of combining these processes to form really reactive radicals. So in this case, you'd get um, essentially two OH radicals. These are super reactive and will, will react with just about anything. Um, they don't stay around very long because of that. They'll react with water, they'll react with each other. They'll react with anything organic. Um, likewise, this uh, um, oxygen here can, can be split. You'd get an oxygen radical and then sometimes uh, 
single oxygen, which is another reactive species, some other stuff. And there's lots of radical chemistry you, you don't need to worry about. This is getting into second order reactions that go really quickly. Um, but just wanted to show you there's a kind of neat things you can do with these chemicals um, that can um, end up, you know, so in this case, ozone could eventually come back and create some hydroxyl radicals, which are even more reactive. So there's different things you can do with them. Some of this stuff happens naturally in the atmosphere, especially in the upper atmosphere where we've got a lot of UV still. Um, but usually when we're designing a disinfection strategy, we don't need to go quite that far. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about free chlorine again. Um, we have introduced you to chlorine. Um, I have mentioned this before, but really the, the big deal here is that HOCl is stronger. And we'll, we'll look at some point at the uh, actual typical rate constants, but it's something like five to 10 times stronger if I'm remembering correctly. So it's significantly faster at um, disinfecting pathogens than OCl minus. And, you know, at, as we know, we've got HOCl. It's got H plus on the other side and OCl minus. So with our equilibrium and then the, uh, our equilibrium constant for this stuff is 10 to the negative 7.54. So given that, you know, this means given that uh, equilibrium at pH equal to 7.54, we have OCl minus is going to be equal to HOCl, okay? And we see that if we add more acid to the system, so if we drop this pH lower, we're adding more H plus, it's going to push that reaction left because we have an imbalance suddenly. The, uh, there's more there's more stuff on the, the reactants, that term. So when we, when we draw our, when we do our equation, right? Ka equals the products over the reactants. So we'd have H plus um, OCl minus divided by HOCl. If we are to change this one term um, Ka is constant, so if we have the ability, which we do, of changing the pH, we can change the H+, plus. then what has to happen is this ratio between OCl- and HOCl has to change be by definition of this equilibrium reaction, this, uh, this equation. So when we change H+, plus, if we increase it, that means OCl- has to decrease. That ratio between OCl- and HOCl has to account for it because the left side is not going to change. That means the total value of this is not going to change. So that's just to say if we adjust the pH to be slightly acidic, so 5 to 6 range, we've taken, you know, if we start at pH 7.54, that's 10 to the negative 7.54 H plus equals, and we change that to, let's say, 5, so that would be 10 to the minus 5, so that's pH 7.54 going to pH equals 5. You can see that big change in the, uh, the molarity there, and that, that's uh, two orders of magnitude, that's um, 100 times more H plus. That means you're going from this ratio where they're equal, then you have 100 times more now. That ratio has got to change about that same sort of scale. So if you go down to pH 5, you do this math, you'll see that that ratio then is um, 97 plus percent of it is now in the stronger form, HOCl. Okay, so that's why pH matters quite a lot. Um, You've seen this, again, several times, so hopefully, uh, if it hadn't made sense in the past, hopefully this is getting uh, closer to mastering it now. 
So just, again, a reminder and a, a description of really why, why we care so much about it here. We saw this example before. If we add 15 milligrams per liter of HOCl to some water for disinfection, final pH is 7. What percent is not dissociated? So that's just really going right back to how much is in the form of HO, HOCl in answering that question. Um, you could change the pH. You could change the amount you add. Those would be maybe good things to do to, um, to practice this on your own. The temperature was given because technically the Ka is temperature dependent. Um, I would just say, don't worry about that. Just say Ka is 10 to the negative 7.54. You could probably look it up and do that if you were curious. Change it and see see what difference it makes. But I'm not asking you to do that or be, be so familiar with that for our class. Okay, so just putting this here kind of as a reminder, we've done this problem before. Um, make sure that you can do it if you can't. Um, make sure you learn, learn to be able to do it. Let me know, happy to help. Um, but you know, as, as we start looking at the disinfection um, technologies, that should become uh, clear why that's, why that's so important. Okay, so as we're adding um, chlorine, another, another thing we have to be careful about is overdosing the chlorine. Um, and what I mean by that is adding so much that we end up forming what we call disinfection byproducts. So a disinfection byproducts is some toxic chemical that's a result of adding a bunch of these reactive halogens in the presence of this random organic matter that tends to be in water. Now this can be true of uh, water treatment if you're treating surface water, uh, a groundwater, um, really any, uh, any water source typically will have some organic matter in it. Um, could also be important for disinfecting uh, wastewater. You don't want to be discharging a bunch of chemicals that are toxic, uh, potentially carcinogenic, um, into receiving waters. So what is a natural organic matter molecule? Uh, I've just snagged a, a picture from the internet here. You can kind of see, um, I think on the bottom, this is a depiction of humic acid. Really, it's some large molecule that's got a lot of branches and pieces and it's uh, in some way some random assortment of um, molecular stuff. Um, and again, this is like when you um, steep some tea and all this brown stuff comes out into the water, has some flavors, that's a, a type of organic matter. The same thing happens in nature, a lot of tannins, tannic acid, um, are associated with leaves dissolving and excreting their uh, their molecules. Um, we call it humic acid for coming from humic substances or soils. There's also fulvic acids, which are kind of related. They're not they're called acids. Um, they're not necessarily super acidic. They just have a lot of carboxyl groups, and that's just kind of how we how we label them, and we can um, manipulate their acidity by ch or their um, their charge based on changing the pH. You don't need to know much about that. Just suffice it that these are large molecules. They've got lots of components, and they will react with the chlorine if we're adding chlorine, or they would also react with bromine or iodine if we were adding those. Uh, we would never really use fluorine for, um, for that, but it's, it's just another halide, right? So mostly what we're concerned about is if we're using chlorine, bromine, or iodine, um, most of the time chlorine, um, those would be, you know, adding those would be a concern. In fact, we, we know that if we have something like the molecule, molecule ethylene, um, or so it looks something like this with a carbon at that center, a double bond, and like that. If we were to exchange all these hydrogens, which are normally sitting here with chlorines, this is actually quite a toxic compound. This would be trichloroethylene, ethylene, or um, 
You can have it totally chlorinated. This is the type of stuff we worry about with um, uh, dry cleaning. Um, dry cleaners will inevitably spill this or have a leaky storage tank. Um, they have or used to, I think they still do use things like this, basically chlorinated solvents. And those are, um, those are a big problem environmentally because they're toxic, they're carcinogenic in most cases, and they don't really degrade very easily. So when we're adding chlorines to random molecules, we have the same sort of concerns for toxicity and carcinogenic carcinogenicity. So given that natural organic matter is thousands of different types of molecules, what we really end up interested in is we have all these molecule pieces, and then at some point we have at the end of a chain something like uh, maybe a methane group here. So CH3 just as one little part of that part of that molecule. And then if we, you know, we can call this R for like whatever else over here. This is kind of the organic chemistry type of thing that that R is whatever is attached. So we can say R um, and then say this as C the H's. Now the deal is if we're over chlorinating, we're going to have a lot of these molecules where we end up substituting that these these hydrogens for chlorines and having what we call trihalomethanes. So this is some big molecule, but on the end here we have that methane group, and then if we over chlorinate it, we end up with you know some molecule, and then we've got these Cl groups. So that's kind of how it works. That's that's what ends up making these toxic. Just wanted to give you an overview um, of what's going to happen if we use too much chlorine in a system. Um, ideally, what we want to do is operate in a way where we have enough to get our disinfection done properly, but not really much more than that. And then what we'll do from there is either um, add something to get rid of the chlorine or more likely add a little bit of ammonia to transform it into the right amount of residual chlorine or combined chlorine to have it for a dis distribution system to keep that a bit cleaner. So just to sum up, we want to minimize minimize chlorine dose really these um, to minimize these DBPs. If you have no, if you have a, a rather clean water source that's just got some bacteria or whatever you need to destroy, you can chlorinate all you want and it shouldn't be really a big problem. Okay, so I want to talk about how we quantify our chlorination how we quantify the effectiveness and what it means um, to have some uh, disinfection dosing. Now this is going to be a, a concept primarily for our chemical disinfectants, uh, although we have a very similar concept for ultraviolet dosing as well. Um, if you were to boil water and heat as a disinfectant, that's uh, going to be relatively similar. Uh, really, the concept is going to be you have some condition that's causing the disinfection over some amount of time. Uh, so I'm just going to write a note that this stuff is for chemical. Um, I'm just going to write this note that UV and heat are also similar. And we'll go over UV stuff uh, next time uh, with some examples. So if we have, if we want to know how our concentration of some pathogen is changing, which is you know, basically what we want to do, we have some number of cells per volume, this N is our number concentration, we want to know the rate at which that's changing, that dN dt. Um, so we have an equation, it's referred to as the Chick-Watson kinetics, and 
what that looks like is that, so it's a first order, so we have n to the one here, we, we recognize immediately this is first order. Um, Typically, we say it's pseudo first order in practice because there's usually a little bit of wiggle room at the start. A low dose bacteria can sometimes repair themselves, things like that. Um, but ultimately, it becomes first order. Or we can handle it in a first order manner without, without much difficulty. And what we have here is negative k, so our rate constant, c to the n times n to the 1. So here we have c and n, and we're doing this as dn dt. So what you'll notice here is this is a little more complicated than normal. So n is our parameter that's changing, that we're tracking, right? That's what we're doing the mass balance on. So the number of viruses or bacteria or whatever. So we have a number concentration, numbers per liter. Um, then we have c, which is our concentration of disinfectant, uh, as you will no, if you think about it, you add straight up bleach right out of the bottle, that's going to be a lot stronger than if you mix it with a bunch of water and then use that as your disinfectant. Um, so, you know, it, it, when you clean, a lot of times the bleach container will tell you, oh, dilute this to X amount for this purpose, and then use that as your cleaning solution. <clears throat> so the dose, again, matters, right? This dose of the disinfection and we, we have a concentration there, the concentration of the disinfectant. And then the other part that matters is how long the bacteria or whatever is going to spend in contact. So that exposure time. So this is the disinfectant concentration. So disinfectant um, concentration times the exposure time is really how we define the dose. This is what we call the CT concept. It's concentration times time, um, also known as contact time. So that contact time really determines how much uh, disinfection we get. And we see that in this equation where we've got that role of the disinfectant concentration being an important component of this rate. Now, uh, there's kind of a neat thing we can do if we can assume that C is constant, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but given that C, we see this N here. Let's take a moment to think about that. That's what we call a dilution coefficient. And this is just going to be one for an ideal reactor. Now, if you've ever worked in a system, you know, in a lab or something with some solution doing some sort of reaction, You'll know that typically in a beaker, you'll have a stir bar or something like that, keeping it like a batch well-mixed reactor. Um, however, if you have, let's say, a, a microfluidic device or a flow-through channel, have something smaller, um, and you're applying some disinfectant or something that's supposed to be reacting, this N may be different, uh, may be quite important um, to account or the fact that your disinfectant may not be mixing through the whole system. Um, or, you know, if you have a, a, large, uh, a large plant and you've got your ozone bubbling through uh, to apply your ozone, maybe there's some corners of your contact chamber that aren't actually receiving that dose. So then you'd have to apply some factor here where N would be less than one so that essentially your that disinfectant contact with the bacteria is less than um, ideal. So it's, it's kind of reducing the amount there. Okay, and uh, the concentration, sometimes we'll deal with mass or maybe molar units. These are kind of typical examples. And for our purposes, we are going to assume this N is 1. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep ideal reactors. I just wanted to show you what you would do if you had a non-ideal reactor. Okay, then the K is the coefficient of specific lethality. That's going to be in units of liters per milligram minutes. Now that at first may look like it's a maybe second order type units. That's because we have the concentration built in here. In, indeed, this would actually be second order if the concentration of disinfectant was changing. However, we can 
simplify this if we assume that, let's say, our chlorine remains constant, which is uh, reasonable in a lot of cases, and we will work the problems this way. So we're, we can assume that the C, or really C to the N, is going to remain constant, and the system simplifies if we, if we say K and C to the N are just one term, we can call that K star, and say that that is going to be our first order rate constant in per minutes. And you'll see here that's, that C gets rid of this liters per milligram. And you'll remember also that our number concentration doesn't have milligrams, right? So that this actually um, was not going to be second order just based on the number concentration twice. Uh, we actually have to factor in that chlorine there. OK, so now we have this k and a k star. And we can simplify to say dn dt equals negative k star times n to the 1. So just like any other, you know, that, that one will go away. Um, just like any other rate equation we've set up so far that's first order, it's first order decay because we're disinfecting. Um, this is just like we've done with that little complication here about k. Um, OK, last thought for you, and we'll pick up here next time, is this k is going to be unique to each pathogen to disinfection, disinfectant pairing. So if you're using uh, bleach for E. coli, that's going to have a different k than bleach to salmonella. They're both bacteria, but they're going to resist it at different capacities. It's also going to be different from E. coli to bleach compared to E. coli to iodine solution or some other disinfectant. So the, uh, the K here is going to be unique to each pairing, which means we have to think a lot about um, how we figure out the dose needed and how we design a system so that it can dose our water effectively to handle all sorts of pathogens. Going all the way back to where we started, maybe some we need to get rid of entirely so that we are very confident that nobody's going to get sick. Some others, maybe we don't have to get them completely eliminated. We just need a safety factor uh, in place. Um, so the question is, is K or K star specific? So technically, they'll both be specific, right? Because K is a part of K star. Um, so K star gets a little bit more particular in that it captures the concentration you're using. Um, so that would also, you know, K star can change even if K is not changing, if you change the chlorine concentration or your disinfectant concentration. But um, likewise, if you keep the disinfectant the same, but you're changing the bacteria or the type of disinfectant, the K star would also change. So the, the question is, K-star is the pairing of the concentration with this K, which is the coefficient of specific lethality. That's basically the, the rate constant um, for the disinfection of some bacteria or virus with the disinfectant. So it's like for each pairing, we have a K. And then K-star will just take that and combine it with C, given that C is a constant. You don't, you don't have to do this. Um, you need to be aware of this relationship in case I give it to you in one form, but it's, it's straightforward to convert those two. It's just the, that multiplication there. All right. Well, happy to answer any other questions. I'll hang out here a moment. Um, but that's it for today. Yeah, I did post a the membrane quiz to Moodle, I think you've got until Tuesday, I think. And then I'll, I'll also post the uh, cryptosporidium quiz. Um, I'll have that due by Thursday um, next week. The exam will still be on November 3rd. Uh, I did check with the, um, that other class that interfered last time, and that's not going to be a problem this time. All right, so we'll see you guys uh, next week. Thank you.